welcome to this Friends of Music uh, webinar. My name is Stina Kacheturian, and I'm currently the chair of this venerable Stanford organization, uh, whose origin story, really, we're about to hear about this evening. So I'm very pleased to say that um, this presentation is being co-sponsored by the Stanford Historical Society, the Michelle R. Clayman Institute for Gender Research, and the Hoover Institution. And so let me very briefly introduce our speaker, Dr. Elena Danielson. Elena got her PhD uh, in German studies at Stanford and her Master's of Library Science from UC Berkeley. For almost 30 years, she worked in the Hoover Archives at Stanford, serving as head of the archives for the last 10 of those years. Her list of prizes and publications and honors is too long to go into here, but I can assure you that we are, could not be in better hands when it comes to taking a fresh look at the amazing Stanford alumna, Lou Henry Hoover, and former first lady, of course, and her equally amazing and accomplished friend, Elizabeth Sprague Coolidge, and their enormous influence on music education and music in general at Stanford University. So welcome all. And if you have any questions along the way, please uh, use the Q&A tab and we'll hopefully get to them at the end of the talk. Elena. Okay, well, thank you so much, Stina, for inviting me to look into this fascinating subject. I mean, I did know that Lou Henry Hoover was involved in music at Stanford and I had heard of the Friends of Music at Stanford, of course, but this was an excuse to rummage in the archives and excavate the origin stories, which is really one of my, my favorite projects anyway. So it gave me an excuse to contact archives around the country. Um, so the Herbert Hoover uh, Presidential Library in West Branch, Iowa has 19 files on the origins of the Friends of Music at Stanford. I found more information at the Library of Congress in Washington, DC, and there's quite a bit also on campus here. And so I got a lot of help from archivists and um, uh, Stephen Hinton sent me uh, oceans of information. I'm still trying to assimilate all of it. So I'm gonna give a preliminary report on the origins of the Friends of Music at Stanford and the role of Lou Henry Hoover and her friend Elizabeth Sprague Coolidge. And it turns out, as it often does, the origin stories are often very surprising. And this one is counterintuitive. Normally, you know, you get a cultural institution established and then as a spinoff, they will come up with a support group um, as sort of an auxiliary. In this particular case, the support group, the Friends of Music at Stanford came first and they worked very, very hard for 14 years to develop a, a platform for music at Stanford uh, instruction and performance and music appreciation and building audiences. Uh, and they spent 14 years doing this before the university actually had a department of music. So this is a counterintuitive uh, story where the support group leads to the cultural institution instead of the other way around. Um, and I knew that Lou Henry Hoover was very important in this project, but she's one of many. It's not like she did it all by herself. And it was really the collaborative aspect of her work that I found so interesting. And the, the fact that the group is called Friends of Music turns out to be highly appropriate because the group and the Department of Music came out of friendships, very close friendships. So let me do a screen share here and see if I can get you some uh, pictures here. Let's go from the beginning. Okay. So here we have a, a photo of Lou Henry Hoover looking very formal, you know, in a gown and all that. It's an uncharacteristic picture. Um, she was happiest, her best photographs are when she's horseback riding, wearing trousers, 
or um, in a Girl Scout uniform. But this is a very beautiful photograph from Vogue, so I, I thought I would show it. So as I said, the story emerged out of archives. And so I've rummaged in a lot of archives. Uh, and I was grateful for help from the Stanford University Archives, uh, which had this wonderful um, score uh, by Roy Harris, the composer, and then the Archive of Recorded Sound scanned uh, an early history of the organization, uh, which is now online. So that was a great help. And of course, the Hoover Archives has quite a bit. And the Hoover Presidential Library in West Branch, Iowa, supplied all kinds of information 24 hours after I asked for it and the Library of Congress as well had a great deal of information. So there are a lot of heroes in this story uh, about the remarkable pedigree of this incredible organization. But as I said, it's full of surprises, full of unrecognized heroes. The main time frame I'm gonna talk about is from 1933 to 1943. So this 10 year period uh, of intense hard work by a lot of people to, to create a music program at Stanford on, on a high level. And um, as we mentioned, Lou Henry Hoover had a dear friend named Elizabeth Sprague Coolidge. And in 1933, Lou Henry Hoover was leaving the White House. Her husband wasn't reelected. They came back to Stanford after his presidency. And she invites her dear friends from Washington to the Lou Henry Hoover House on campus. And after one of these visits, she gets a present of money to support music uh, at Stanford and bring in quartets and chamber music. And so she writes a thank you letter to Elizabeth Sprague Coolidge saying she's hoping for a nucleus of people. She wants to pull together some people who will create a little more music. And she said she wasn't going to broadcast this. She wasn't gonna announce this to the world because she was afraid her dream might not be realized. And, and she was not one to tip her hand in advance. But she did say that even under the best of circumstances, it would take years to accomplish. This was the depression. There was no money. It's hard to imagine today, but Stanford was very cash strapped and um, didn't have much margin <clears throat> for luxuries. But Lou didn't consider music a luxury. She considered it a necessity, especially in hard times like the Depression. So who is this woman that she wrote to? Elizabeth Sprague Coolidge uh, <clears throat> was born in um, <clears throat> 1864, <clears throat> died in 1953. So she was a little bit older than Lou, lived a little bit longer. And here she is. <clears throat> you can see her picture on the right. <clears throat> here she has a young society woman. She came from a wealthy family. She was a, a concert level, professional level pianist. She even did some composing. But because of her station in life as the daughter of a wealthy man, she wasn't allowed to appear in public. It was a violation of her station in life. Um, but she, for her, music was the center of her world. And she had um, a crisis in 1915. Both her father, her beloved father, and her husband died in 1915. And she was overwhelmed by grief. And then what she decided to do was to transfer, transform her private grief into public philanthropy. So she became a patron of music. Um, and she um, gave part of her um, inheritance to her father's beloved Chicago Symphony. But she, her, and I think she founded a, um, a program for retirement for mu musicians, something very much needed. But symphony wasn't her thing. She liked chamber music. She liked music in a salon, in a living room, after dinner with intimate friends. And so she decided to devote her money to promoting chamber music. And she had a son. And she realized she was spending his future inheritance. And as a good mother, she decided she better explain. So she wrote a letter to her son and she said, um, darling, people who live as well as we do have an obligation to devote some of those means uh, and opportunities to the community at large. And he apparently understood this. So she commissioned music 
Um, and she created music festivals. It is exhausting to read her biography by Carilla Barr. She was uh, setting up music festivals in Rome, in uh, New England, and um, she coordinated the finances, she paid for it all, um, she coordinated the schedules, just transporting instruments is, is a very delicate operation. And then there are the temperamental personalities of artists, as we know can happen. And so she smoothed over ruffled feathers and she commissioned music and her talent beyond logistics was she had a great sense of quality. So she commissioned music from the finest composers often before they were recognized uh, by anyone else. And so her commissions take up 11 pages in her biography, a fine print. It's all from the very best uh, composers. And we're talking about Bela Bartok and um, Igor Stravinsky um, and she, um, also identified chamber music groups such as the Pro Arti Quartet, which was probably the best quartet or certainly one of them at the time. She discovered them in 1923 and the Belgian Pro Arti Quartet will play a big role later on in this um, story. So this is the woman uh, who uh, commissioned uh, the Appalachian Spring from Erin Copeland. And you can see her here next to the dancers, um, Eric Hawkins and Martha Graham. And she's quite tall for a woman born in 1864 for her generation. When she was 17, she had a passport to go to Europe and it gave her height a six foot one. So for that generation, she was a very imposing woman. And when she wanted her way in an organization, she, she kind of got it, you know, uh, but she never stole the limelight. There are um, interviews with uh, composers she worked with in the Library of Congress, and they say, once she gave you the money, it was all yours, and she didn't want to steal your thunder. The, the glory had to go to the musician, the composer, and the music. So she was a remarkable woman. And so who was Lou Henry Hoover? Well, Lou Henry Hoover, as Stina said, was a graduate of Stanford University. Uh, she majored in geology. She wanted to be a geologist, but she couldn't get a job. Women were not hired to be geologists. There were even rules against this. And she was quite disappointed that she couldn't have a formal career as a geologist. So instead, she had a whole series of different careers. And she did do a remarkable book on geology uh, with her husband, who was uh, Herbert Hoover, was also a geologist and a mining engineer. So when they lived in London in 1912, they published this incredibly scholarly uh, book. So that was sort of her crowning moment as a geologist. And then she went right on to other careers in 1914. And this is going to be important later on. In 1914, when World War I breaks out, she's living in London and her husband gets involved with the Commission for Relief in Belgium. Belgium's been invaded. The German army occupies it. They're taking the food supplies. Children are starving. Um, there's a humanitarian crisis. And so Lou Henry Hoover helps her husband raise money for food supplies. And she does this at Stanford. She goes to Stanford. She raises enough money to outfit an entire ship with food to send it to Belgium. And this is a skill she uses later on. Her fundraising talents were quite remarkable. And she had to travel a lot. So she wrote her sons a letter explaining why she was gone so much. And she said, you know, I'm going to admonish you to do this as well. If you see something um, that needs to be made better, do it. If you just have, uh, you know, a few uh, dollars, a little bit, uh, just use it. If you have big opportunities, then go for big improvements. So just like her friend Elizabeth's letter to her son, Lou also told her children that they would have to accept the fact that mom was going to be out in the world making a difference for good. And so I think both Lou and Elizabeth came from the same place. And so Lou, knowing that women's opportunities were often limited, her, her biggest career, and um, she put most of her energy into building up a small organization founded by her friend, Juliet Lowe, called the Girl Scouts. This actually started before World War I, and then uh, took traction later in the 20s. And Lou um, started with Juliet, her good friend. This was another friendship 
situation. And uh, there were just a handful of Girl Scouts and she built it into a, a big organization. <laughs> and here she learned another skill that came in handy. She learned how to run organizations. And she grew this Girl Scout organization in two terms as president and one term as honorary president from a handful of girls to over 850,000. And by the time uh, she passed away, nearly a million girls. It's often said she invented Girl Scout cookies, and that's not exactly totally 100% true, but there is a grain of truth in it. She did promote bake sales, and here you can see her in her Girl Scout uniform. She's much more comfortable in a Girl Scout uniform than a silk gown, helping girls plan and cook and, and come up with fundraising. Um, and so this was um, her main uh, mission in life, was improving the status of women. But the last career of her life and the crowning career, uh, she used all the skills she used in these previous careers. And she decided that she was gonna make music the center of her last career. Now, it's important to remember that, and I've been reminded of this by some of my fact checkers, Stanford already had a lot of interest in music from the very beginning. So it's not like Lou Henry Hoover invented it all by herself. There was a, an orchestra, a student orchestra in the very beginning in the 1890s. There was a church choir. And there was also for athletic events, there was a military band, which I guess is the forerunner of our um, famous Leland Stanford Jr. marching band. So these three organizations did have um, a list in the um, uh, academic register of classes, the annual register. Uh, they were one unit each for choir, orchestra, and band. So there was no major, there was no department. And music really didn't have a presence until after World War I. And there was an effort to build up music then. Uh, and they, the university hired Warren D. Allen as organist. And he's another hero in this story about the Friends of Music. He did an amazing amount of work. And he was organist until 1947 when there was a formal, finally, a formal department of music. So here is Lou Henry Hoover as a Stanford student. She was good at math. Uh, she loved science. And here she kind of looks like a, a, a 1960s flower child <laughs> uh, because she liked collecting botanical samples and mineral samples. So she was into science in a big way, but it was in a creative way. She was very good at math. And we know here at Stanford that quite a few people with a facility with mathematics, with higher mathematics also have a strong interest in, in music. So, so music and math do seem to go together. Um, but there was no music program. Uh, Lou did bring her sister, Jean Henry, to Stanford during the summer to study violin, uh, but there was not much there for Jean, and so she, she dropped out. But there was a mandolin club, and I just had to include this photo of these um, Stanford students and their amazing white dresses. Okay. Um, so music at Stanford uh, was an amateur thing in the most part, but the Associated Students of Stanford University did come up with a major coup. And this was 1896. They brought um, the, the composer and pianist Paderewski to Stanford. And he was like a rock star. This was like bringing the Beatles, you know, to Stanford. It was a, a sellout crowd. There was no venue on campus big enough. Um, the church hadn't been built yet and there was no memod. So it was in the San Jose uh, Auditorium. That was the only place big enough. There were special trains that took people there. Some people rode on their bicycles. And this was the beginning of a very close friendship between Paderewski and Herbert Hoover and Lou Henry Hoover. And uh, later, <clears throat> when Herbert Hoover uh, was involved uh, with relief in World War I and in its aftermath, uh, he worked with um, Paderewski on an independent Poland. It had been under the Roman Roman, <laughs> under, it sounds like it's under the Russian Empire. And so Paderewski was one of the people um, who very much wanted an independent Poland. And Hoover and Woodrow Wilson worked to make that happen. And they were friends ever after. And Lou um, kept in touch with all these people and brought Paderewski to the White House to play in the White House in, in the um, uh, 1930s. So, we're now gonna to go to Washington, D.C. Um, 
in the 20s and 30s. What's going on? Washington, D.C. is where Lou Henry Hoover and Elizabeth Sprague Coolidge become very close associates and very, very warm uh, friends, kind of a mutual appreciation society going on here. So Elizabeth Sprague Coolidge, as we know, was commissioning original compositions, mostly chamber music. And so she asked for the original holograph handwritten score for all of these works she commissioned. She had a huge collection. And these are by the top composers. I mean, it's Hindemith. I mean, it's like all the big names. And she wants to deposit the scores in the Library of Congress, but not to be stashed away in boxes and hidden. She wanted the music to be brought to life and performed. And she decided to build a chamber concert auditorium at the Library of Congress and set up a Coolidge Foundation to foster music. This took a special act of Congress um, to do it because it was changing kind of the, the mission of the organization, but she just got things done and it went through Congress in five months. Can you imagine today trying to do something like that in five months? It's, it's unthinkable. So she built this charming auditorium. I've been there. It has superb acoustics. It's small. The musicians do not have to try hard to create volume and lots of sound. You can enjoy the finesse of, of, of quiet notes. And not only is the sound beautifully designed, the acoustics, the sight lines are perfect as well. And guess who liked going to concerts at the Coolidge Auditorium? Lou Henry Hoover, who was living in Washington, DC. So Elizabeth invited Lou to concerts at the Library of Congress, and Lou invited Elizabeth to concerts at the White House. And even though the depression was a very depressing time, there was a lot of hardship. Music created joy and um, some kind of consolation. And it was actually uh, really the, the, the best remedy uh, for the, the bad mood of, of those years. And so Lou put a lot of energy into music partly because it brought people together. And she, like Elizabeth, preferred chamber music. She preferred the small intimate groups where it was about the finesse, it was about relating to the musicians um, and the musicians responding to the audience. And uh, she expanded the music program. There had been a music program in the White House. There was a broker who brought in mostly uh, foreign musicians, which is fine. Uh, but Lou decided to expand it to include American musicians. And so she brought in a harpist named Mildred Dilling, and they became very, very close friends, as you'll see later. And she wanted um, choirs from the historically Black colleges in the United States. So she brought in the African American choir from the Tuskegee Institute and the Hampton Institute. And this was a great success, even uh, at a time of um, a lot of prejudice. Uh, this was a very successful program uh, that Lou developed. And so this friendship between Lou and Elizabeth, which started in Washington, then gets um, taken to the, the United States. But one thing I wanna emphasize is the White House Music House, which she called chamber music music house. And I've seen that in some of the music department advertising too. I love that. It's old fashioned, but I totally love it. The White House Music House were never photographed. The archivists have looked, and they're good. These guys are good. They've looked everywhere. There are no photographs of the White House concerts. There are no recordings because these were private bonding experiences. And so even though Vladimir Horowitz, you know, we, we do have a photograph of him coming off the ship in 1931. We don't have a picture of him inside the, the, the White House. So she was not, Lou was not one for public relations displays. Um, she was more of a, of, of a private person. But there was one event at the White House that got a huge amount of publicity and fanfare. And that was the visit of the King and Queen of Siam. They came for a dinner at the White House. Um, actually, the King came for cataract surgery, but uh, everyone was so delighted to see them. They made a lot of fuss over them. And so um, Lou Henry Hoover had a chamber concert for them after dinner. 
This was not photographed either and not recorded, but apparently Lou engaged this charismatic harpist, Mildred Dilling, to play. And she put on apparently a beautiful show. She had an ebullient personality. Um, she was apparently the first harp teacher for this comedian named Harpo Marx. And so uh, she, she, she knew how to work on a stage. And she was also frequently on stage with uh, performers like Bing Crosby. So she, Mildred Dilling made this a great success. And Mildred and uh, Lou Henry Hoover were close friends ever since. So in 1933, Lou Henry Hoover, as I said, goes back to Stanford, lives in this beautiful Lou Henry Hoover house that she designed herself. And she and Elizabeth work very hard year after year on creating a music program at Stanford. So they bring in many events um, starting in 1933, 1934. And by 1935, there is what she wanted to develop, which was a nucleus of friends of music that would support music financially and uh, as um, attendees and also to raise the awareness of music among the students. So to thank um, Elizabeth Sprague Coolidge for funding all the concerts she brought in, um, Lou Henry Hoover had a, a reception for her of 300 and some people at this house. So it, it was a, a remarkable, it was a remarkable friendship. And one of the um, groups, one of the chamber groups that came year after year was the Pro Arte Quartet. So this was the quartet that Elizabeth had spotted in Rome as one of the best in the world, brought them repeatedly to Stanford. And um, of course that was very important to both Lou Henry Hoover and Herbert Hoover because they had this big experience raising money for the starving people of Belgium in World War I. So this was a very significant um, quartet for them. And the quartet did play at the Belgian pavilion of the New York World's Fair in 1939. And um, so, so this was one of the, the main quartets that created this atmosphere of chamber music at Stanford. Another that was brought in was the Roth Quartet. They came from Hungary. And um, they not only performed, but they turned out to be good instructors. And the Friends of Music at Stanford from the very beginning, you can see this in all the correspondence, it's not an end in itself. They want to promote a department of music. They want instruction and they want the best. So we had the dream letter that Lou wrote in 1933. You know, I'm, I'm dreaming of this music program, but I'm not willing to broadcast it. By 1935, uh, we have more and more groups showing up on campus sponsored by um, Elizabeth Sprague Coolidge's foundation. So she's spending a lot of money on Stanford. And Lou has to smooth over some ruffled feathers because there were people um, who were worried uh, that the money coming to Stanford would divert funds from them. So Mills College in particular was dependent on Coolidge for its music program and didn't want to be cut out of the action. And so Lou's letters are highly diplomatic, explaining that we, we were going to have some creative synergy here. There's going to be a surge of interest. There's going to be more funding created um, and not less. But Funding was an issue because Elizabeth Coolidge's fortune was also affected by the Great Depression. Uh, she didn't have infinite means. I mean, she wasn't Rockefeller or anything. So what Coolidge decided is she would provide seed money, matching grants. She asked Lou if Lou could come up with the other half, the matching half. And Lou had a lot of experience with fundraising. She had done it for Belgium. If she had done it for the whole country of Belgium, she could do it for Stanford. And so she put together a group of donors to raise money. And if you look at this list, it's some of the most eminent uh, names in the community. Um, so um, there's the, the Frank Duvenex, um, Flyshacker, and of course, Mrs. Her Herbert Hoover, she donates a substantial amount of money too. Mrs. Timothy Hop uh, Hopkins, 
um, and there's um, Mrs. Koshland and a very important figure, Mrs. Sigmund Stern. And she does have a name, Rosalie, <laughs> uh, Rosalie Meyer Stern. She's very, very important in this group as what we'll see later. And then for the people who couldn't provide a large donation, there was an annual membership to raise money. Uh, so at $10 a membership, and in the depression, $10 actually did something. Uh, there were quite a few more people in the membership group. And I wanted to highlight one. He's another one of my heroes. When you read archives and correspondence, you, you get to like certain people. And one of them I really, really like is Dr. Hans Barkhan. I had never heard of him before, uh, but he was a um, concert quality violinist. He was an ophthalmologist and he was just an all around amazing man. So Lou, not only pulls these people together and gets them organized, gets the concerts going, um, hires musicians who are able to teach, she's also now seriously doing fundraising. And there's enough fundraising, even in the depression, to support instructors. So the Roth Quartet is hired um, by Alan, Warren D. Allen, the organist, the other hero in this story, and hired and um, uh, President Ray Lyman Wilbur is kept in the loop. Uh, Lou and Wilbur and Herbert Hoover were all friends from their student days. So they communicated very easily in the same network. And so Lou made sure that Wilbur was very aware of everything that was going on. She didn't want to step on any toes. And so Alan and uh, Lou and Coolidge um, get the members of the Roth Quartet to give music instruction. So the Stanford students were getting violin lessons from the best violinists in the world from the Central European tradition. Um, I mean, it was just an incredible uh, experience. And this is in the middle of the depression and war is brewing in Europe, war is already broken out in Asia. It was a very scary time politically. It was a very strapped time financially, uh, but music just blossomed. And Alan here, and he's such a sweet man. His letters are, are really wonderful. And he, he explains the hiring to Wilbur. He says, I'm deeply grateful to our generous friends. And he calls them friends um, who have made this valuable contribution to the musical life of Stanford University. Um, so music to him was not a luxury. It was a necessity. And in addition to the Pro Arti Quartet from Belgium, and the Roth Quartet from Hungary, Elizabeth also brings in the Kolisch Quartet from Vienna. And Rudolf Kolisch was a student of Arnold Schoenberg um, and probably his best interpreter from what I've read. I'm not an expert from what I've read. And he was also Schoenberg's brother-in-law. So he's on campus giving concerts and lectures to students and this is like firsthand information uh, from the, you know, the, the wealth of culture in um, Vienna at the time. So we've got these three quartets on campus and it, 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 people notice, people notice. And here's a cartoon um, from Harold Schmidt's history of the Friends of Music. And it's about these three quartets, you know, and um, so the Kolisch Quartet, the Roth Quartet and the Pro Arti Quartet. And, and the caption says, you know, if the Bay region is not addicted to chamber music now, it's not the, the fault of, of these people. And, and the um, artist who did the cartoon, Sotomayor, is a major artist in San Francisco at the, at the time. So, so Lou brought the people together, got the car, concerts going. Um, it, she doesn't do it by herself. Obviously, there are a lot of people involved. She gets the money together, but she doesn't rest on her laurels. There's one more missing element. In addition to enthusiasm and a support group and money, you need a formal structure. And so uh, at the beginning of 1940, she wrote a formal constitution for the Friends of Music at Stanford. And she got recruited her friends, including um, uh, Fritz Barkhan there. That's the brother of Hans Barkhan. Uh, so the whole family was, was musical. And so she gets a, a board together, uh, people who are going to put not just money, but time into building up the Friends of Music. Um, and this is none too soon because 1941 was going to be the golden jubilee of Stanford University. They needed a big celebration and they needed people to support the music at this celebration. 
And Lou was probably very happy with getting this constitution signed. She's the first signature as president. And I uh, guess I looked at the Stanford Daily. Guess what happened that same day? There was a concert by, guess who? Mildred Dilling, the ebullient um, harp, harp player. And not only did she play her harp, she brought her collection of antique harps from her home in New York. Do you have any idea what is involved logistically in bringing antique instruments safely across country? I think even today, that would be a major accomplishment. So we have this sequence of steps. Remember in 1933, Lou's letter said to Elizabeth, this is gonna take years. Don't expect this to happen right away. And it may not happen at all. But step by step in 33, they start bringing the quartets. Uh, they have a dream. In 37, Lou steps down as president of the Girl Scouts. She suddenly has more time. In 38, she starts the fundraising. In 1940, she's got the constitution going. And 1941 is the anniversary year of the university. And one of the friends of uh, music at Stanford and, and just an extraordinary woman and in a bunch of very extraordinary people uh, is Mrs. Sigmund Stern, uh, the founder of Stern Grove. And so in 1941, in honor of the Golden Jubilee, she brings Bela Bartok to Stanford. I mean, what I would give to have been there, he gave a talk, you know, not just about his own music, but about his research on folk music and the, the research he did, not just, you know, in Hungary, but in, in uh, the Czech lands among peasant groups. And he also uh, talked about Perry's work with folk music in, in Yugoslavia. It must have just been a phenomenal time uh, for music at Stanford. And Mrs. Stern just made it happen. She, she was also friends with Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo. So, you know, she, she knew how to do things. Um, and, and another interesting figure for the um, anniversary celebration was a composer named Roy Harris. And um, I think people still know about his work. Um, and he was quite a, a, a charismatic man himself. You can see he has a big smile. His students, his students loved him. Uh, However, he was famous as being the composer who never wrote music unless he was paid a big commission. And so they wanted him to write a special piece of music for Stanford's Golden Jubilee, the 50th anniversary of the university. He said, sure, I'll do it, but it'll cost $500. And in the depression, that was an enormous amount of money. Uh, but Dr. Hans Barkan, one of my heroes, um, and Elizabeth Sprague Coolidge somehow made it happen, but they didn't publicize it because they were very careful about the diplomatic repercussions of, of you know, one, one composer getting more money than, uh, than another composer. Okay, so it's the 50th anniversary of the university. It's 1941. The university almost didn't survive. If you think about it, in 1893, when Leland Stanford died, the university was hit by a huge lawsuit. The money was frozen. And uh, then in, it almost, the university almost collapsed, except Jane Stanford kept it going with her jewels and things. And then in 1906, with the earthquake, the buildings collapsed. The university almost was destroyed again, and, the, and it somehow survived. And then think right after that, you get World War I, and, and young students are being drafted and sent into battlefields. And then after that, you get the Great Depression, and Stanford survived all of this. So they were going to celebrate. But it was 1949 was a very, very dangerous year. Uh, when you think about what happened September 1st, 1939 in Poland, um, a, a war was raging in Asia. The war in Europe was going to expand. Uh, the United States was probably going to be brought into it. And the university fathers decided we're going to celebrate anyway uh, because it's a big accomplishment. And so um, the same people who were in the Friends of Music at Stanford worked on the celebrations for the 50th anniversary of Stanford University. And they got the San Francisco Symphony to play in Frost Amphitheater. And this was to an audience of 7,000 people. So this is no longer chamber music. It's a, this probably wasn't Lou Henry Hoover's cup of tea, but it was quite magnificent. And they had 
a special kind of high-tech lighting. They call it mercury lighting, whatever that is. So for, for 1941, it was the best lighting available. So they had the concert outside and the newly built Hoover Tower was glowing in the background. Um, and they barely got the tower finished in time for this event. But somehow these people were just able to make things happen. You know, it was, it was a hard time with financial exigency. There was a lot of trauma about war and the depression, uh, but somehow these people just had the ability to make things happen. And I think the secret was these networks of friends. And Pierre Montu, like Paderewski, was something of a rock star, apparently. I went on the website and he made his musicians really work. He used faster tempi than any other conductor, and, uh, but, but the results were apparently uh, uh, worth it. And with the construction of, of Hoover Tower, Herbert Hoover decided he had to put the weightiest instrument he could find at the top of the tower. So he got the Belgian carillon out of the, the um, Belgian pavilion of the World's Fair in New York. So this is 1939, the World's Fair. The Belgians have a carol on there. It weighs 18,000 pounds or something like that. And somehow Herbert Hoover manages to get the carol on over to Stanford. Can you imagine getting the, the bells up the elevator? Um, <laughs> it, it was quite a production. And uh, Lou Henry Hoover was called in to consult on the reconfiguration of the blueprints for the tower because they had to restructure the top of the tower to accommodate this and the acoustics. Um, and then this wonderful Belgian man, um, um, Camille Lefever, he did the installation of the carillon. So all the wires and everything. And the largest bell in the original Belgian set um, had an inscription in Latin, uno pro pace sono. So for peace alone do I ring. So the symbolism with war breaking out all over the world of a, of a bell and a carillon dedicated to peace, the symbolism was pitch perfect. Unfortunately, the bells themselves were out of tune. So the, the bells had this sort of jangly sound. Some of you may be old enough to, to remember <laughs> the original carillon. It had this lovely kind of jangly noise and, and I liked it, but people who had, um, you know, perfect pitch, they, it, they really, really didn't like it. Okay. So we've, we've celebrated the, the 50th anniversary of the university and all of a sudden music is taking off at Stanford, it's getting traction. If you look in the annual registers, as my friend showed me how to, to look them up, by the 1940s, they're teaching the history of music. There's more music instruction. There's no major yet because there's no funding for a department chair and all that organization that goes into it. But by 1943, so 10 years after Lou Henry Hoover's letter about her dream to Elizabeth Sprague Coolidge, about 10 years later, Lou knows there's going to be a department. Once the war is over, they couldn't do it during the war, uh, but once the war is all over, she knew that there was going to be a formal department of music at her beloved university. So she wrote another letter to her friend. And this one, most of her letters are typed and meant to be a record of the organization. And they have details about finances and committee work and all those pe petty details. This one is handwritten and it's quite celebratory. And um, it's not dated, but it had to be about 1943. And she um, says to Elizabeth, you must truly feel that the seeds you began planting just those few years ago are beginning to bear a large crop of fruit in a very short time. Well, it wasn't a short time. It took 10 years of hard work by a lot of people, but, but Lou is taking a moment to celebrate. And so she said, um, she said that um, after um, I get back to Stanford, she's, she's also in New York at this time when she's writing to, she's in New York writing to Elizabeth in, in DC. When I get back to Stanford, I hope you have time to come visit me at Stanford and we'll have a dinner party for you so you can meet the executive board of the Friends of Music at Stanford and their husbands and wives. So um, the friendship did bear, bear fruit. 
So as uh, I mentioned, um, Lou Henry Hoover died in 1944. She was age 69. She'd had a very demanding life, uh, but I think she had accomplished most of what she wanted to do. And um, Ray Lyman Wilbur, her good friend from their student years, now president of Stanford in 1945, 1944, delivered a beautiful eulogy for her. And at the end, uh, he had the Carillon play a concert for 15 minutes. And the Carillon continued to be played. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, these mathematically inclined people tend to be good at music too. And so Professor James Angel of the engineering department played the carillon for years and years, but he always lobbied for an upgrade. And Tim Zerlang, who's the current caroloner, he also played the old uh, um, um, instrument and he also wanted an upgrade. Um, and so uh, between the year 2000 and 2002, the bells were dismantled. Can you imagine taking these things down? Uh, I just I, I, I just worry about that man on, on top of the bell. I hope, <laughs> I hope there are no accidents when these things happen. Anyway, the bells were dismantled and they were sent to Europe to be retuned. Most of them were replaced some, and more were added. And um, so Tim Zerlang can now uh, play an instrument dedicated to peace um, we still have the inscription, um, una pro pace sono, I only ring for peace. Uh, so we have the, the uh, music for, for peace and it's now played in tune. And um, I went to the 80th anniversary concert uh, for the Hoover Tower and Julie Zhu from the Stanford Music Department played the carillon and I had a chance to talk to her afterwards. And uh, I did mention the, the Friends of Music at Stanford. And when I did, she just broke out in a big smile and said, oh, she knows the group very well. They supported her work and helped her on a concert tour. Um, so the tradition that these friends started in 1933 is uh, alive and well at Stanford today. And uh, a lot of people helped put together this story. So I wanna um, conclude just with a, a list of names. Um, Karen Bartholomew did the fact checking, uh, Benjamin Bates scanned things for me, Ron Danielson did technical work, Stephen Hinton uh, sent me more um, information that I could assimilate, I'm still working on that one, uh, and I heard from Spencer Howard, uh, Karen Nagy, Tim Noakes, Miriam Palm, uh, Shamissa Redmond, Matt Schaefer, David Sun, they all helped put this together, and so the, the friends of music at Stanford has had stops and starts and, and reorganizations. For a while it was called the Music Guild. And I'm glad you've gone back to the name Friends of Music at Stanford. Um, it sounds antiquated and old fashioned, but actually it's completely appropriate because this required, this effort required the collaboration of a lot of dear friends. So thank you very much, Stina, for getting me started on this research project. If there are comments or questions, I, I think uh, we can accommodate those. Hi, Elena. Um, there is one question so far uh, from Marika, which is, oh. why was Lou Henry Hoover so involved with Belgium? Ah, okay. So, um, so Lou Henry Hoover um, always tried to leverage her projects. So whenever she came up with, uh, uh, and she, she came up with one career after another, one project after another. Um, but when she worked on uh, the history of mining, she came up with this concept and she did it because she knew her husband would love the project and he'd be involved too. And when her husband was working on relief in Belgium, she was going to be his secret weapon and his fundraiser. So she coordinated her career and her many careers actually, in such a way that each one supported her family and her husband, but also engaged her talents and her interests. And that was one of her um, great skills, was being able to coordinate the, the best interests of a lot of different people. So she originally did it for her husband, but absolutely her own heart was in it. We know that. And we know it was a very popular cause on campus. So when she, she was um, a beloved figure on campus. And when she gave talks, uh, they were written up in the Stanford Daily verbatim, the ent entire speech. And she gave speeches for 
the relief in Belgium. And it brought the whole campus community together and uh, raised a huge amount of money. And um, it's a little bit analogous, you know, today in, there are war zones and people are trying to raise money and put together food supplies and medical supplies for refugees. Um, and, you know, we know that's still a problem today. And it was a, a very ser serious problem in World War I and, and again, of course, in, in World War II. So refugees um, are a tragic fact of modern life. And Lou was always very sensitive to the welfare of people in need. She was a very empathetic woman. Um, and it's what she actually loved doing. She felt if she was helping people in need, you know, she felt that she benefited from it. So it, it was a very um, idealistic um, attitude she had. So thank you for that question. Uh, those are all the questions we have in the moment. Okay. Um, just give it a moment here in case anybody else needs to type in anything, but I think that might be all we have. Okay, okay. So thank you again to all the people who put together the different details of this story. You know, I was pestering people all over the country <laughs> for documents and archives, and I got wonderful cooperation. So I'm, I'm really very, very grateful. Um, and I even went to Lou Henry Hoover's birthplace, which is in a town called Waterloo, Iowa. And um, there's a statue of her there with, with a globe um, because her interests really were global. And thank you again, Stina, for inviting me to, to do this presentation. Uh, we had one person who just said, can you say something about Lou Henry Hoover's birthplace in Iowa, which you just did. So that was actually <laughs> per perfectly. <laughs> okay. Well, perfect it's a honey. charming, it's a charming little city. I, I had never been there before. Um, but my, my husband, you know, decided we were driving through Iowa. And so we just go and check it out. And I was very pleased to see, actually, there are two statues over there. There's one statue of her holding uh, De Re Metallica, which is this uh, mining uh, a treatise that she annotated and translated. And there's another statue of her with the, the globe because of her global interest. And one interesting factoid, she was born in 1874 in this tiny little town in Iowa. And her husband, Herbert Hoover, was born the same year, 1874, in a tinier, tinier, tinier town called West Branch, Iowa, not very far apart, but they never met until they got to Stanford. So, so there was something about Stanford that appealed to both of them. Um, are there any recordings of the concerts on campus at Frost or at Hoover House? Uh, recordings of concerts of what? Uh, the question is, are there any recordings of the concerts on campus at Frost or at the Hoover House? Oh, okay. Um, I have tried to find a recording of the Ode to Truth by Roy Harris, since it was composed specifically for Stanford. The archival recording of sound does not have it. Um, and so if any of, any of you find it, let me know. I'm desperate to find it. Um, I don't believe... I. I Oh, there was, there was a recording of the Brandenburg Concerti um, by the Roth Quartet in Mem Odd. It was the first, it was the very first concert in um, Memorial Auditorium by the Roth Quartet over several evenings. They did the entire uh, uh, Brandenburg uh, Concertos. And that was recorded and broadcast over um, NBC radio. It was very high tech at the time, yeah. I don't know about other recordings from Frost or from um, uh, Mem Odd, but I'll do some research on that because it does, does interest me. If I were more technically adept, I would have included clips of music. The Library of Congress has a lot of clips of music. So if you're interested in some of the uh, commissions that Elizabeth Sprad Coolidge um, funded, you can get those on the Library of Congress website. And there's a wonderful, and it's quite short, it's just a 10 minute documentary on Elizabeth Sprague Coolidge, but it includes clips of recordings 
of the music she composed. Now, some of it's very famous, you know, Respighi and all that, but there are other lesser well-known composers who are quite good. And so I recommend listening to that. It's just a, a real joy. It's a real joy. And uh, last question that we'll take here is uh, from Michelle. She says, how did she, I'm assuming meaning Lou Henry Hoover, hear about Stanford? Oh, <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, Lou Henry Hoover is one of my favorite people. When you, pe when you read people's diaries and, and letters, you, you get to know them as personalities. And I just adore her personality. She's a warm, generous, creative person in all her relationships. And um, she was always interested in science, even as a, as a young girl. So she, she wanted to pursue science. Um, she did, however, um, uh, get a degree in education from San Jose Normal School, now San Jose State. And she did teach briefly. Um, and she did do some accounting work. Her father was a, a bank teller and she did accounting with her father, which helped her later in life. Um, but she went to a, a lecture on geology by John Casper Branner, who was apparently quite a dynamic speaker. And he was talking about geology as the history of the earth. So this isn't, this isn't a very, this isn't this ultra specialized modern kind of science. This is the science like, like opening up the history of, of the world. It's more in the style of um, Alexander von Humboldt and natural science rather than um, geology the way we understand it today, which is more chemistry and stuff. Um, so she went to this lecture and she really, really uh, responded to his personality. He uh, was a very good mentor. He was very open-minded about women students in science. So there were not other women in the classes, but he encouraged her to go ahead and, and major in science. And uh, she really did want a career. They were quite close. And um, she would go along on um, geology trips where they would go camping and fishing and all of this in sort of groups of students. And so it was John Castro Branner who brought her to Stanford. She came, um, in 1895, and so her first year was um, Herbert Hoover's last year, even though they were the same age, she had already gotten a couple degrees already <clears throat> um, at San Jose State. So uh, she came to Stanford specifically because of John Casper Branner. And after she got married and was working in London, she did a lot of uh, publishing with Branner. So it was a lasting relationship, like most of her friendships were. They, they went on for decades. So when she lived in London right before World War I, she and Branner published a lot together on the chemistry of the clay used in ceramics, um, on um, a seismologist named Mill. Um, so yeah, so it was John Casper Branner who brought her to Stanford. And of course, he was also Herbert Hoover's mentor. So I guess they fell in, Herbert Hoover and Lou fell in love over their geology samples. I, I, can't, I can't quite visualize this, but you know, these things happen. Alrighty, I think that's, I think that's all the questions for the moment. Um, there was a, a comment from Kay Phillips, which I posted in the chat for everybody um, regarding okay. the, uh, regarding a, a comment. But other than that, I think that's all the open questions we have at the moment. Well, Zach, thank you very much for making all the technology work. That, that is impressive. My pleasure. <laughs> okay.